physics here at the Hebrew University and he studied the effects of uh, uh, noise correlation and neural electrogeneity on the neural code. Uh, after a postdoc at uh, Boston University with Stephen Colburn and Nancy Cockrell, he started his own lab at 20, uh, 2008 at Ben Gurion. And he, his current focus is the theory of plasticity and learning in the brain and attention selection. Today we're going to hear about uh, moving synaptic or synaptic motility and functional stability in the whisker system. Thank you very much. So it's always a pleasure to, uh, to come back. I'm going to talk the, about the uh, uh, interplay between um, activity dependent plasticity, specifically in the form of spike time independent plasticity, and the uh, transfer of uh, sensory uh, signal. And I'll do this. Uh, <coughs> using the framework of uh, the whisking uh, signal. <coughs> Maybe I will um, <coughs> well, I'll say a few words about the whisking signal. And then I'll, <coughs> I'll try to, um, to explain to you that um, the, the uh, synaptic motility, what we know about it, actually uh, challenges our understanding of, uh, of the transfer of, uh, of sensory uh, signal in the brain. <coughs> and I will uh, then propose that actually activity-dependent plasticity may uh, offer one possible solution, 
we analyze this in, in, in three uh, uh, stages of, of uh, increasing complexity. And then I'm try to relate these findings a little bit to drifting representation. Time permitting, I'll say a few words about uh, the reader problem, not because we studied it, but because people are very interested in, in the reader problem in, in, when talking about uh, drifting representation, or do more like a discussion. And uh, I will then <coughs> uh, talk about several predictions of theory. So rats and mice are uh, nocturnal animals and they run in dark places. So they, they use their, uh, their whiskers to probe the nearby environment. So they, they move the whiskers back and forth, more or less in a rhythmic manner, as you can see uh, here in the, in the top right. <coughs> so, so the whisker moves uh, along around some, some midpoint, fluctuates uh, with an amplitude that varies slowly in time, uh, with an um, angular um, velocity that is more or less uh, 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 stable. So <coughs> in this case, uh, a phase of zero would be maximum protraction and phase of pi would be uh, maximum reduction. As you can see in the circles here, uh, the specific uh, neural material code tend to fire near maximum retraction. And so on uh, phase of minus pi. And this is this is illustrated here in, in the raster plot that shows <coughs> the uh, spi spectra, uh, the phases in which this uh, neural fire okay, in different twists uh, the phase along the uh, whisking side. As you can see the this neuron tend to fire near the uh, near minus pi. Okay, so this is somewhere here in the, in the um, <coughs> tuning curve of the neuron that, that actually tells you that there is information embedded in the span activity of this neuron about the um, uh, about the phase along the whisking cycle. We did not uh, yet look into that <coughs> at, at how the STP affects this. This will be done later, and of course as the phase is, is, in, is in an angular volume, and you can also look at the uh, tuning of this neuron in a polar plot. And you can see that, okay, so this third phase of this neuron is around, around, around the pi. But you can see there are other neurons with preferred phases of around 60 and so on, up to uh, minus 30 degrees. Okay, so you can see that the distribution of preferred phases is, is rather wide, but yeah, you, can, you can estimate that it's, it's, not, um, it's not uniform. Okay, so if you consider, uh, and then this uh, this missing signal is transmitted downstream <coughs> to brainstem, thalamus, and cortex, and throughout this pathway, one can uh, find whisking neurons, okay, with uh, foot phases that are widely distributed on the ring, okay. Um, so if you try to fit some sort of a von Mises. Um, uh, to, um, Distribution, you can see that this couple is, is, is around one, so zero will be a uniform uh, distribution. And this couple in this case is around one, <coughs> and, uh, and they distribute around a, a, uh, a mean phase that depends on the specific brain region. Okay, so so uh, typically, the couple is, is around one, some, some claim that it's, it's lower, <coughs> and the, <coughs> the uh, uh, fruit phases in, in different regions differ according to the specific brain region. <coughs> and if you consider the most um, simplest uh, model for the transfer of, of uh, the whisking signal downstream, so we assume that uh, assume a, um, sort of a, a threshold linear uh, model for the neuron, we know the recurrent connectivity in, uh, in, in the cortex, then essentially in this case, the preferred phase of the downstream neuron will be determined by weighted averaging of the preferred phases of its inputs, okay, weighted by the uh, synaptic coefficients. I have a question. So this is uh, 16 spikes, the full scale? This is? Si uh, the full scale of the uh, polar plot on VPM is 16 spikes per second. So that means that at most they fire four spikes per second in the... <coughs> Okay. Most of the thalamic spikes that. Um, okay, so don't take my word for it, but I think this is the the uh, the, the uh, tune part. Okay, but but yes, it's it's more or less. You're not you're not very wrong. <coughs> you, can, you can see you can see here. So you have, you have about twenty whisks, and you have less than I think. Can you have less than 100 uh, stuff. No, so, so, okay. so, so if you have, you can probably have a, um, a 
uh, a spike every um, two weeks. Oh. That would be a, a reasonable uh, assumption. Okay. Okay. Yes. Is it the claim here that the VPM neurons are less tuned or untuned, or are they are, are both VPM now for neurons tuned? Um, so the question I need to look it up. I let's see. Why would you say less tuned or more tuned? Um, well, I, I, that I mean, it just it just looks a little bit from this plot like the VPM neurons are a bit more all around, and the L4 neurons are a bit more directional, but I bet maybe this be my... So, 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 so the data is, it, it's difficult to say something too conclusive about the data, because, so, the, the ones with the, uh, the closer to the origin are less tuned, okay? So, so you have, because they're less tuned, you also have uh, less confidence, I guess, about their third phase, okay? And when you say tuning, so, so you need to consider the, the peak to peak variation, the, the DC, you have to consider the, um, the width of the tuning. So it, it's, not, it's not that clear. Right, right. My, my question is, is more just sort of like what, what kind of computation do you think is happening from the BPM to L4? Is, is it just that, right, if you're just doing <coughs> your combination, then is it effectively you're, you're just uh, turning a bunch of different uh, base selectivities into one phase selectivity, but you're not actually getting anything out that's more interesting, or are you increasing the selectivity, or are you um, doing something else, I don't know. So I'm not asking this question. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah. uh, you, you see what, what question I'm asking in, in, in a couple of slides, okay? And uh, this is a good question, but uh, we didn't address it. Okay. So we don't know what is the computation, we don't know if, if the, uh, the, 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 the mouse uses this information at all. And if it uses that, to what, to what end, okay? It's a good question. We're far right. from that. <clears throat> I said, we would like to, to study the transfer information, we only tra study the transfer of the signal. Okay. And if you just transfer the signal, then, then why do you need the LGN in the middle? That's it's a good question, okay? <clears throat> so, if the, if the phase of the Nelson neuron is, is determined by uh, um, a weighted average of the phase of its inputs, weighted by the selected points, then the light of the, the uh, selected motility, we have some problem. And, and, and people have shown that uh, uh, signs are extremely volatile. For example, uh, if you follow this uh, purple uh, synapse, and it changes from 300 to 150 in a few days. The uh, blue one changes from 100 to 150 or so the green from 50 to 75 and so on and so forth. So, so you have changes in, in on the order of 50% of the synaptic points during a period of about several days. <coughs> and here comes a problem because if the, um, the third phase of the downstream neuron is determined by a weighted average of the third phases of its inputs weighted by uh, the synaptic points and, and, and the plasticity is, is dominated by activity independent plasticity, then the, the phase of that neuron will be just a random average of, the, of its inputs. In that case, we'd expect if we uh, average uh, n, n inputs, we will obtain a distribution that is an hour by a factor of 10, okay, then the distribution will be uh, in the talons. Okay? So if you, if, you, if you expect that this couple, which is one of the variants, more or less, the sharpness, it's linearly with the number of, of pooled neurons. So already when we have about pooling information of 20 neurons, we, we have kappa, which is an order of magnitude larger than what we uh, uh, observe empirically. <coughs> Another uh, issue is that if we just randomly average the, um, the phases in the dancer population, then the mean <coughs> uh, phase no, sorry, of the absolute population, the mean phase in the downstream population will be just the mean of the absolute population up to a delay. Okay, this is what we see. So what I'm going to, uh, to suggest in this talk is that activity-dependent plasticity may actually offer a solution to this problem. So now that I should teach you, I'll say a few words about, <coughs> about STDB. So 
and, and what people, uh, uh, how people addressed it and a little bit of what we know. <coughs> and then we go back to our question and apply SDP to, our, uh, to the transfer of whistling semen. So, so when, when people pay uh, pre neurons, neurons, induce finally presynaptic neuron, wait a period of some delta T, and then induce finally the post neuron, wait for a second and do this again and again for uh, so 60 to 100 times, then uh, and when we um, <coughs> measure the uh, change in synaptic weights <coughs> after sparing, uh, for example, in the uh, results of pin pool, they reported that uh, we have some sort of a temporary asymmetric habian plus T in which Samus is potentiated in the causal branch, so when the post fires after the threat, and then depressed in the A causal branch when the post fires before the threat. Okay. So this is some sort of an configure is some sort of a microscopic unsupervised learning rule. Okay, so, so it's learning because it's a plasticity of, uh, of the uh, uh, synaptic weights. It's microscopic, it specifically uh, uh, describes the change in synaptic weight itself. Uh, and it's, it's, it's unsupervised because we don't have a teacher signal, we don't have a, a, a reward signal, just the activity uh, of, the, of the network and uh, modulation of the synaptic weight. So throughout the years, uh, many others, other labs in the same lab as well, reported a wide array of, uh, of <coughs> plasticity rules. So we had temporary semantic habia. They also uh, reported some sort of a Mexican hat, some sort of a difference of Gaussian, maybe um, uh, temporary symmetric habia plasticity rule. But people also reported a temporary asymmetric, uh, uh, some sort of an anti habia or inverted Mexican hat, uh, anti habia Temporary symmetric uh, rules, or maybe some sort of a difference of delta function, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so, how do, uh, um, do people uh, investigate uh, STP theoretically? So, essentially, what we do is we write the change in set weight, we have that w is for the weight, there's a sum of the terms, so we write potentiation, pluses here, and depression, and we also have uh, uh, scaling by some. <coughs> Uh, learning rate, which will become important uh, very soon. And of course, we have some uh, weight dependence of the uh, learning room and, and temporal kernel. Uh, and temporal kernels can, can vary. It can be a, a temporary symmetric uh, hadian, like in, in being poor, or it can be anti hadian, or Mexican art, or temporary shifted. And for the synaptic um, <coughs> weight dependence, we, uh, we, we took the, uh, the, the good. Uh, uh, choice. So essentially, for the uh, what we do is for the potentiation. The idea is to decrease the potentiation when you are nearing the uh, uh, upper threshold of the synaptic curve. Okay. So, so when W reaches one, we decrease the potentiation and we decrease the depression uh, close to the uh, lower bound, which is zero. <coughs> and we have two important parameters. One is the is the relative strength of depression, and the other is the the linearity of uh, of the uh, weight dependence function, which mainly we focus on the limit that, that mu is close to zero, which is termed the additive learning group. Okay, this is where the interesting stuff occurs. Um, so, how do, uh, how do we proceed? So, uh, in order to derive the kind of equation to describe the temporal evolution of the synaptic weight, we look at the uh, uh, changes in the weight for in short durations of time, and the change can occur either way for the was Postsynaptic stuck at that time, and then you go back in time, look at the times of the presynaptic uh, uh, firing, and then we um, weigh by the uh, uh, STDP rule, and we sum them all up. And another uh, <coughs> contribution is the, the presynaptic spike. And then just uh, divide everything by delta t and take the continuum limit and obtain a, a differential equation for the temporal evolution of synaptic weight. Only it's a stochastic differential equation. So <coughs> it's stochastic because. <coughs> it is driven by the, uh, in addition to the SDP, it is driven by the pre-post activity, okay, which is inherently <coughs> noisy. So essentially, SDP dynamics, even without addition of any other uh, factors that, that uh, add noise, it inherits noise from the uh, noise activity of, of noise. <coughs> However, when the learning rate is, is is, uh, is slow, okay. so there's a personal time scale between the characteristic time scale of uh, neural activity 
and the <coughs> and the uh, ten times the for elasticity, we can replace the uh, uh, um, product of the fine by its by its um, <coughs> expectation and, and obtain deterministic dynamic equation that describes the mean select points and the driving force for this uh, SDP rule is the is the product of the SDP rule and the pre post correlation. Okay? <coughs> So essentially, um, what we obtain is we obtain uh, uh, dynamics, which is high dimension because we have many more, many, many synapses. It's coupled because the activity of the post moon depends on all of its inputs, not on only on the specific synapse, and it's non -linear. So essentially, <coughs> what one should expect is to, to obtain all the richness that nonlinear dynamics can offer. However, because people think of, of SDP as some sort of a uh, a learning process, we expect that in the learning we will converge to some sort of an optimal solution, which is going to be uh, um, <coughs> represented by some sort of a fixed point. Okay? Because we expect that we will not be able to, to improve it anymore. So, so if we converge to a fixed point, <coughs> then left hand side is just zero, and, and it's much more easier to, uh, to invest in. <coughs> so, sorry. Um, are you uh, assuming a particular network architecture here? Is this uh, just a feed forward, right? You just have like the, the thalamus and the cortex, or is it a current? So here I didn't assume anything, <coughs> okay? When, I, when we analyze the transmission of the transfer of the whiskey signal, we will assume uh, feed forward, okay? <coughs> so already when you have feed forward connectivity, <coughs> You, you will have uh, interaction between different synaptic weights because the, the activity of the post node depends on, on all of the on all of its inputs. Okay, so already you have uh, uh, interaction. Okay, <coughs> we can also uh, incorporate uh, uh, regard connectivity. It's not easy. There are a few ways to do that. Uh, it's not perfect. There's, there's a limit to what you can know to compute analytically, but this is a, a different talk. Um, but when you talk about the dynamics, though, you're talking you're talking about the dynamics of the, of the weights. Yes. And, that, and that's, that's conditional on a certain type of activity, right? Because like the yes. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Okay. So essentially, what <coughs> what we can show is that, um, for for example, having the statistics of excitor synapse in inherently induces uh, uh, positive feedback, so a strong synapse is more likely uh, when, uh, when the uh, presynaptic spike arrives, it's more likely to induce postsynaptic firing, so we're more likely to sample the uh, causal branch, we're, then we're more likely to potentiate the synapse, and then the next time we have a, a presynaptic uh, spike, we are far more likely, likely to induce firing, so we uh, potentiate the strong synapses. In the weak synapses, <coughs> then if, this in, if the synapse is very weak, then SDP then just randomly sample uh, the, the side area of this curve, and uh, the exact equation will be uh, affected by, by, the, uh, by the net area. So if the, uh, alpha, if the relative surface of depression is stronger than one, then the net effect will be to decrease uh, uh, weak synapses. So weak synapses are depressed, and strong synapses are, are potentiated. So we have this basic uh, <coughs> positive feedback mechanism that generates my stability. Are you going to derive another focal plant theory from that, or could you jump to here? <coughs> I just did. <laughs> no, that wasn't the full. Uh, I, th I thought you were going to derive there. So where are where is the focal plant? Where is the, sure. is the noise zone? Where is, is it? There is no focal plant. So, so, so when it takes when it takes maybe, but uh, when it takes uh, to zero, there is no noise. Okay. We're looking at deterministic. Uh, uh, Dynamics for the for the mean uh, sample points. This is the mean free focal plan. Okay. Okay. So you do the focal plan and then you're taking the mean of the you just looking at the dynamics of the mean that counts from the focal plan. Okay. So <coughs> essentially that, that's how you get the uh, the uh, uh, cross correlations from from the from the product from the product of your activity. So essentially, you assume that if not sufficiently small, then the dynamics uh, um, average over time this term, okay? And if not this small, then this is average for a fixed 
relatively fixed. Uh, so, so you can add the full focal pack and then put the mean of that, and that's what we showed us for the solution? No, because, uh, because in the limit of lambda goes to zero, I can just replace this with the uh, uh, cross correlation. Okay. <coughs> Uh, it's replaced by the expectation. So I replace it with the, with the uh, <coughs> if lambda is, is small, I can replace this by its temporal average, which without thinking I replace it by the uh, 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 average of the ensemble. Okay, so that, that's what, exactly what we do. <coughs> okay. Um, so uh, this basic uh, bystander mechanism actually can be amplified. This is uh, from the work of, of Robert Kuti and colleagues uh, with correlation. So if you have inputs from two uh, subgroup uh, of correlated neurons, for example, coming from uh, one eye or from the other, or from one whisker and the other, then you can imagine that the, the red neurons are uh, correlated and the yellow neurons are correlated. Then a red spike will arrive in contact with other red spikes, so it's much more likely to induce final post so we, we amplify the, um, uh, <coughs> the basic uh, um, bystable mechanism, and this generates sort of a winner-take-all competition between uh, these samples. Okay, so this, this is been used to uh, account, for example, um, for the uh, development of vocal dominance and so on, selectivity. And this generated a lot of excitement because <coughs> uh, in unsupervised learning, uh, we don't have supervisors, so we don't know what's, what's the, the goal of the, of the network. So we need to assume some sort of a uh, um, compression principle, but we don't know what the compression principle is. Here, here, we start with this microscopic uh, um, uh, learning rule, uh, unsupervised learning rule on the, on the uh, synaptic level, and show us that it can actually infer the statistics of its input. Okay, so we, so we show that what, the, what possible compression principle that this STP one can, uh, <coughs> can apply, can implement on the microscopic level. Okay. And similarly, uh, uh, inhibition has been shown to, uh, to, to induce uh, a negative feedback, which can uh, then uh, act as, as some sort of a homostatic plasticity uh, uh, mechanism. <coughs> so uh, this is as to a lot of excitement. The problem is how to proceed. OK, so the problem in, in, in in, in proceeding in investigating what what is this to be doing, how how, uh, <coughs> how the brain develops this MSTP or whatever, is that we have uh, the, the preparation that we use to measure the STDP room typically lack functionality and behavior. And, and functionality is essential because the STDP dynamics is driven by the STDP room multiplied by the by the activity. So we lose that. So we don't know how to behave, and we also don't, in, in, in preparation that we have the behavior, okay, it is extremely hard to, to measure the STP. Okay, so we have a problem to derive prediction that we can then test uh, empirically. So, after this detail, we're going to go back to our simple model <coughs> of um, food for population of Wussing signal, and we will uh, introduce spike time implant plasticity to the synaptic weights. And hopefully I'll show that it can actually, uh, um, um, it can cause the development of a distribution of uh, preferred phases in the adaptive population. And hopefully we'll be able also to uh, derive several predictions. So, uh, <coughs> so the models will be very simple. We have a population of whisky neurons, including these thalamic whisky neurons. And we have n thalamic whisky neurons that are projected onto the same downstream cortical neuron, and the whisk neurons <coughs> have some sort of a DC term or mean activity and some sort of a, um, a rhythmic activity, and each neuron, and they all uh, follow the same <coughs> uh, whisking phase, but each has its own preferred uh, phase. <coughs> and the downstream neuron will be a delayed linear neuron, and as a result, <coughs> okay, because all these inputs are, are rhythmic, and, and they are all special with the same rhythm, then the downstream neuron is also going to be uh, to fire with it. And, uh, and its um, main response is its DC component and its uh, rhythmic activity and its, its um, uh, phase, preferred phase, are going to be determined by 
in the order parameters, all the synaptic weights go fine. Okay, so the, in this point, we just be joined by the uh, mean synaptic weight, and <coughs> here, and the, uh, the weight component in the third phase will be determined by the population vector, its magnitude in its phase, and the delay of the uh, synaptic weight. And we'll address this in, in, in three stages. First, we'll in, in, in three stages. Um, first, we'll start with a um, uh, with ST dynamics. We'll only allow a single synapse to, to become plastic. This will allow us to assume a uh, weak coupling. And the utility of that is that it provides us a free theory that can then be utilized to, uh, to explain some of the results that we'll see later on. Uh, and then we'll allow all the synapses to become plastic. And we'll first uh, study the case where kappa is zero, when there's a, a uniform structure of present phases. Okay. And then we'll extend it to, uh, to the uh, general case where kappa can be positive. So, when, um, <coughs> when only a single uh, synapse can be plastic, then essentially uh, the uh, synaptic weight width converts to a fixed point that depends on the phase difference between the, the phase of the presynaptic neuron and the phase of the postsynaptic neuron. And the utility of this free theory is that <coughs> we have complete understanding to each and every parameter of this model. We understand how the relative strength of depression uh, uh, affects the, the uh, important synaptic profile, how the how mu affects it, how various features of the uh, STP will affect it. And essentially, um, <coughs> for example, okay, so for example, um, okay, if you consider a temporary asymmetric heavy index this two, okay, then essentially what you obtain is that the uh, ST2 will uh, uh, potentiate synapses that have negative phase. So they, they on average five before the post neuron and depress the and synapses with positive phase. Okay? If you have a temporary symmetric, some sort of a Mexican hat or difference in Gaussian rule, then the ST2 will potentiate the uh, uh, phases that are phase difference that is, is small and depressed in the larger ones. In the limit of the additive rule, the, the uh, transition between depressed and the potential will be very sharp. And as we increase this, uh, 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 the, 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 SDP, the profile will become smoother and shallower. And we understand how uh, depression uh, affects how different features of the uh, temporal structure. And also uh, how the, okay, so for example, the uh, STP uh, rule has some, some characteristic time scale. So if you induce this thing at very high frequency, then eventually uh, <coughs> the resulting profile will be uniform, uh, become, become, become independent of the, uh, of the preferred phase. Uh, <coughs> so what happens when we allow all um, <coughs> synapses to become plastic? So as I told you before, we're going to start first with a, a uniform distribution of preferred phases. And so why is it interesting? It's interesting first because we don't really know what the weight value of kappa is. Kappa can be actually smaller than one. How small it's, it's yet to determine, I guess. Uh, additionally, and then for us, it allows analytical treatment, which you can then extend in a particular manner. But additionally, it's also important to, to realize that in the, uh, so when kappa is zero, okay, when the uh, preferred phase are say, evenly distributed in the ring, they can just uniformly pull all the, uh, the synaptic weights, then we'll end with, we're going to completely lose the whisking uh, signal, okay, just because of the structural interference. Okay, so the mean will be sum, but, but the, the rhythmic activity is going to be cancelled. If we allow a random pooling, then again, the mean will we increase like the uh, uh, like end at the number of, of pooled LG neurons. Yeah, sorry, um, the PM neurons. Uh, but because of attrition, we will get some bump of activity at certain phase, which will give rise to a rhythmic uh, component at the right location. <coughs> but it will be weaker by a factor of 1 over square root of n relative to the mean. So if by some mechanism <coughs> uh, we can subtract the, um, the mean, is to the leading order, then you can amplify the, the whisking uh, uh, component. And this is uh, an alternative um, uh, 
uh, solution, at least for a couple equals zero. That has been uh, discussed by others, and maybe we're not going to um, address it. We'll say a few words about it in the end. <coughs> um, However, what we want to do is to uh, introduce um, <coughs> STDP. And um, again, as I told you, if the uh, static equation were to be uniform, then no uh, whiskey signal is going to be transmitted. Soon. However, the uniform solution is not always stable. Essentially, <coughs> if, if the real part of the Fourier transform of the STDP rule, the delay STDP rule, <coughs> at the whisking frequency, um, is positive, then the uh, uniform uh, solution is not going to be stable, and, and the preference for some phase is going to be to develop. And, okay, so, so, K tilde and, and alpha zero are the, are the uh, uh, magnitude and phase of the, uh, uh, the Fourier transform of the STDP rule, the delayed STDP rule, which will um, um, accompany companies in the, in the next slides. So what happens in this case is that <coughs> even if we start with, with uh, a uniform static weights at, at 0.5, okay, so, so the x-axis is the identity of the, of the different uh, node or synapses, and they're organized when they do their phase, phase so they're on 0, 3, 6, and so on, and to uh, 360. So already, so this is the average of over the uh, first uh, second. So already, when you average over the first second, you see some sort of a hill, a bump that, that uh, uh, was generated because of the fluctuation in the, in the uh, spine activity of the neurons, which generated a uh, fluctuation in the, the static waves. And as a result, STP can pick on this little bump and amplify it, and then amplify it some more, and amplify it some more, until it reaches some sort of a, an asymptotic uh, magnitude. However, the set profit does not converge to a fixed one, rather it remains the night, changes over time uh, continuously. So see these left equates change over time throughout their entire uh, uh, dynamic range in this case, even though the uh, the magnitude of the, the set equate profile on the, on the, the magnitude of the population that was set equate profile on the activity of the rhythmic activity of the dance, you know, converge to a fixed one. Okay? So the rhythmic activity, the strength of the rhythmic activity converts to fixed mode, but the phase of the dance neuron, okay, continues to drift in time with the uniform drift velocity. Okay? And so, can we get a, a fixed one? And the answer is um, yes and no. <coughs> um, so if, if we assume that we have a fixed point, Solution. Okay, then the, the uh, static wave profile is constant. This means that the rhythmic activity of the dancing neuron is also going to be constant. So, the, so its preferred phase is going to be constant. So this means that we're actually back and under the conditions of uh, of a free theory. Okay, we have a dancing neuron that finds its, its, its fixed uh, phase. The uh, absolute neuron finds that fixed phase. Then the uh, static wave profile must obey the profile of the free theory. Okay, so we assume. Can be symmetric cambium, the limit of additive rule, we're supposed to potentiate the negative phases. So if you potentiate the negative phases, <coughs> then the, the phase of the input to the dance neuron is, is going to be at minus half pi. This means that the, that the uh, phase of the dance neuron must fire at minus half pi plus its delay. And this must coincide with the assumption that the phase of the dance neuron is at zero. Okay? So, so we need to fulfill some sort of a, a self-consistent criterion, which is translated in, in the <coughs> to the STP rule by demanding that alpha zero is zero. What happens if, if this condition is, is not fulfilled? So, for instance, if we if uh, the rhythmic activity is, is um, for example, uh, at uh, is slower, okay, again. The, the, uh, if we assume that we have a, a fixed point, then the profile of selective weights is, is supposed to be uh, the same. The input will be again at a phase of minus half pi, but then the expected uh, uh, phase, third phase of the dancing neuron will be negative. So this means that the phase of the dancing will be pulled to the negative uh, uh, direction, which will then 
pull the static uh, weights for to the negative direction, we will end up with a negative drift velocity. So this is the basic mechanism that generates the slimming cycle. Again, if, if the uh, um, rhythm activity is in a, in a higher frequency, then <coughs> the uh, expected phase of the downstream neural will be positive. Okay, will not uh, comply with the self consistent condition. This will pull everything to the positive uh, direction and end up with a positive uh, drift velocity. So this is the basic mechanism that generates uh, this limit cycle. <coughs> So a fixed point is, is, a, is a special case in which the drift velocity is zero. It's not the typical case. So um, again, in, in the limit of, uh, of, uh, because in the, of that rule, we have a, a, a very good understanding as to what exactly determines the uh, drift velocity and specifically how the, the, uh, the form of the uh, temporal structure of the STP rule uh, affects the, uh, the drift velocity and, and what we make it drift to positive or to negative uh, uh, side. But essentially, the, the main point is to know that, again, in terms of the drift velocity of the third phase of that room, the STP rooms affects uh, the, the velocity only through uh, two major for the, uh, um, parameters that characterizes the STP room, not the uh, uh, tiny little uh, 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 fine uh, detail, but actually only to k theta and alpha zero. Um, so <coughs> what happens when the um, uh, foot phases are not distributed uniformly? In this case, what happens is that, again, for one of the parameters, STP does not converge to a fixed foot, rather converges to a limit cycle. So <coughs> if we have the, the non-uniform distribution, we have more red synapses. Initially, the red synapses were potentiated. <coughs> So the phase of the dust will is around pi, but then it will be pressed, and the, the yellow one will potentiate it, and, and, and the green, and so on. And the phase changes in time. But now, because the distribution is not uniform, drift velocity is also not uniform. So this room, for example, <coughs> uh, so the time this room spent between, fa between phase of, say, 90 degrees and zero is four times longer than the time spent between 180 and 90 degrees. Okay, so you just randomly sample this room, we are four times more likely to find, find in the first quadrant than in the second quadrant. So, so this, uh, uh, this limit cycle that the uh, STP converged to induces a distribution over time for single neurons, which is then translated to a distribution over the, the population of a, in layer four. Um, and again, the, the, um, the probability of finding the you neuron know, in a specific phase is, is proportional to the, to the 1 over the um, drift velocity okay, in that phase. And again, for, for small uh, kappa, we can use our, our, our understanding um, uh, to, um, to derive exactly how, how different parameters affect the, the drift velocity, but mostly we're interested in how, it, how the phase of that rule affects the um, Velocity because this is what determines the, um, the distribution of the fertilizer in the population. For example, if these factors are positive, then the risk velocity will be minimal when uh, psi is minus 10 degrees, okay, which, mean, which means that in this case, the uh, most likely uh, phase shift will be minus 10 degrees plus, plus a delay. Okay, if, this, if these factors are negative, then uh, uh, we can get a plus nine degrees uh, phase shift. So essentially, for a small kappa, this is what you can get, plus or minus nine degrees up to uh, the delay. And how much time do we have? 10 minutes. So, so to understand how uh, the, um, the width of the distribution in the, in the absolute layer affects the width of the distribution, you see distribution and color codes so when kappa is zero, that's when we have a uniform distribution. Then we have a uh, distribution that's shifted by by half a pi um, um, plus a delay, which then is decreases as uh, as kappa decreases until you reach a, a fixed point. Okay, so in a fixed point, without noise, we just have a, a delta distribution. So initially, the, the distribution will be determined on parameters of ST, but eventually, you just want to convert to the third phase of the uh, up, up population. We understand how um, 
most features of the temporal structures affected, and also how the different <coughs> So if, we, if one will induce uh, um, artificial wisdom for long periods of time, okay, then what we expect is that for sufficiently enriched stimulus, basically the, the uh, distribution of the prophase is expected to become narrower, and also the mean is expected to be closer to the mean of the absent population. Okay. Uh, so um, the second thing what we show you is that um, the STP dynamics actually induces a, a, a distribution um, of preferred phases by changing the distribution, by changing the phases of individual uh, neurons, which one can relate to uh, the issue of different uh, representation. So, for example, in, in this, this example, we work from um, this from colleagues. You see uh, um, many uh, um, tuning curves, color coding, <coughs> of different neurons uh, uh, in response to some, let's call it linear uh, uh, variable. Let's think of it as a sort of a phase. It's not a phase, but can think of it as a phase. So you can see that in this case, we have slightly uh, more representation to, say, to this phase and to, to that phase. But then if we go back to this same population 10 days later, you see some sort of diffused um, representation. But certainly, we, we love the representation because the different neurons still are, are responsive, but they're responsive to, to different places. But if we now rearrange the uh, uh, tunicles neuron not according to their identity or their preferred uh, phase in day one, but according to their preferred phase in day 10, we will retrieve the distribution of the preferred phases in the population. So the distribution is, remains stable or less, but the identity of the single neuron or the preferred phase of the single neuron changes over time. So essentially, people think of it as, as, uh, as having two forces that work uh, uh, in parts. One is the sort of activity between the states and the that, that uh, uh, draws us to the structure, that draws the system towards a fixed spot or, 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 or a, or a some, uh, fixed manifold, a stable manifold, plus the monster that, that allows us to move along this manifold. What I showed you uh, today is that we don't need the north. STDP can generate this inherently by, by, uh, by, its, uh, by its dynamics. The contradiction here would be that the thing would move. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, here neurons uh, uh, lose the, the relationship between the, the preferred uh, stimulus and other neurons' preferred stimulus, where, while in normal that they don't. So the correlation between neurons here change a bit. Can you wait two minutes? If I have to. Yes. Mm -hmm. About the uh, time scale, I mean, is there any relationship between the uh, time constant of the STDP uh, and the, the, the drift the, in time of, of the representation? And is there anything that you can actually predict? That's, that's, that's difficult because many different factors that, that come into play um, we don't have, well, well, we can estimate, okay, if you do pairing for 60 times and you can, you can measure how, how much the synaptic point changes, but, but then you question, okay, but the, 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 the animal is not whisking points for 24 hours a day. So, so the, the, and then you have touch, which is what will affect also things. So it becomes complicated. Can, can you estimate the relaxation time? Because it's an equilibrium, so can you estimate the relaxation time? So how long would it take to lose the structure or something like that? Given uh, microscope. Given? Given microscope parameters. Okay. Given the relaxation time. So, so we, have, we, have, we have several unknowns here, including uh, how, how much time is this new uh, whisking and how much each whisk uh, affects. Again, the preparation are done in very uh, um, so to, this is a, this is a very very naive model. So then, was SDP is, is is at best some sort of an approximation, okay? And and think that there's some evidence that that just two spikes SDP is not going to do the job. We need some sort of a burst, but but one can hope that um, whisking signal is, is sufficiently strong uh, a signal that can be used. 
as the people, but the preparations that people are interested in, we don't have whiskey. So, so it's, it's hard to, to tell. Uh, but but I mean, here, here it's 10 days now. Okay. Uh, Given the time of SDP, do you expect the, the reshuffle within 20 minutes? It's not clear to me the time scale that, that the theory would be uh, for a reshuffle. Or after what time scale, it's pretty sure that it should be reshuffle. We should get to know it's completely different. I don't think that's an experimental question. I know it's a question. The different question is, is it does a theory give us? This different yeah. regions, you see different time scales. What? In different regions, you see different. No, so, so first of all, it's about matching. Does, what does the theory? Kind of well, it can, can be naive in a given number, but I, I think it would be uh, too naive. Uh, but, but, but I think I'll follow your, your advice in, in a couple of slides and see that you can get other predictions okay, before that. Okay? Because we don't do. Okay. Um, so. We'll skip that. If, if, if you want, I can talk to you about this in the discussion. Um, let's go back to your consideration. So what I show you is that SDD can provide a mechanism that generates a uh, drifting presentation, which induces uh, distribution of red phases uh, in the industrial population. The mechanism itself is, is a dynamic mechanism. Okay, It induces a, a, a distribution of the type of signal, which is then translated to a distribution of the population. And the, the basic prediction. So first of all, you want to the preferred phases are dynamic. Okay, you should be able to, to see that they change in time. Uh, and they also, as you know, said, should show a consistent drift velocity. Okay. Moreover, this distribution, this, this drift velocity is supposed to be uh, related to the distribution of third phases. For example, it's supposed to be minimal at the most uh, likely third uh, phase. So, for example, in the limit of zero noise, okay, even if, if the uh, uh, drift the, the velocity is small, we're supposed to be able, if we measure the preferred phase at uh, time t1, following as far as the preferred phase that we had at time t0, then even if the drift velocity is very small, we're supposed to see a consistent mean that they are all above the t1. Okay? We do the histogram, and it's histogram, but as you can see, it, it's, it's shifted from, from zero. If you have a little bit of noise, again, it, it, it's, you know, we have some sort of a, of a hill, but again, the, uh, the, the mean is, um, is different than, than zero. And you should be able to see it. The, the question is, is how much statistics we have and how much is, is, the, is the noise, whether it's, it's activity independent or it's because the spike activity uh, are relative to the uh, deterministic part. Okay, so in all of these cases, the, uh, the mean is, uh, is shifted by, uh, by some measure from, from zero. The question to be able to see it is, is the amount of data you can collect. <coughs> but this can be contrasted with what uh, the, the balance theory uh, proposes. For example, in balance theory, okay, then the um, first phase of the balance theory, uh, might be because of some fluctuations, or some, a few sign of cells of close by uh, phases, can potentially develop some fluctuation, and that generally the preference to, towards this uh, uh, location. Now, some sort of uh, uh, fluctuation can then cause these sinuses to, to modify a little bit, this is some sort of a, of a hill of distribution of nearby preferred phases. But in the balance uh, uh, mechanism, we can have another type of fluctuation. We can have fluctuation which is non local. There is some sort of a, a bump of activity that can arise in a different, completely, different, completely uh, statistically independent than the, the first activity. So we expect to find also a uniform shoulder in the distribution, at least for copy. Also. OK, so not a perfect one, but there are some fingerprints that we can look for uh, in the data. Um, Additional prediction is, of course, that the uh, if one is able to measure the telemocortical, uh, the STP uh, uh, the telemocortical synapse, then it should be uh, consistent. Uh, then, it, then it dictates a specific distribution uh, of the phases which should be consistent with what people measure in the cortex. So 
we need a good measure for that to make any quantitative uh, estimate in any case. And of course, we can manipulate the, um, the uh, input statistics by inducing uh, um, high frequency stimulation to whisker, which is expected to, to make the uh, distribution of fluid phases narrower and shift it towards the fluid phase of the um, uh, down superposition. Okay. So just to end, um, what shown is that SDP can retain the functionality in this case in, in the sense of the uh, stable distribution of preferred phases um, uh, in the face of course it's selected remodeling, but it's more than that. It's not that the uh, functionality was retained, it was retained in spite of the cortex synaptic remodeling, but it was retained because of the cortex synaptic remodeling. Okay, so in, in this case, this, this whole synaptic utility, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Okay, so we have just thank uh, um, our students and collaborators in uh, funding. And the work I presented today was done by um, Rod, who's now somewhere in, in Texas, I guess, and in Utah. And thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so happily, um, okay, so, okay, so um, what, what bothers me uh, in, in the presentation is how can we maintain a stable representation of the world if, if the identity of different neurons is constantly changing, different phases are changing, how can we have a, a stable representation of, of the different phase? And we can actually quantify the, the representation. We can, can quantify how accurately uh, a mouse can, can, um, can locate the azimuth of, of, of the whisker. So, um, so if you have some sort of a, a distribution of foot phase, which is not uniform, uh, the question relates to the, to the readout. How can we read this? Uh, how can we read the phase of, of this uh, direction to the neurons? And, and there are several uh, options. One option is to um, is a celebrated population vector. <coughs> so population vector uh, just weighs the, the, the vote of each and every uh, neuron by its uh, foot phase. And population vector is going to be biased. Okay, the distribution is biased. And it's actually going to be limited by, by uh, 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 collective modes of fluctuation. Okay. So people don't like it because of that, but it does mean that the brain doesn't use it. Anyway, this choice requires some measure of fine-tuning because we need to follow the preferred phases of each and every node. So we need to, to be able to read them out and we have to, to drift after them as well. So we might have a, a different level. We need to assume some sort of, 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 of tuning, continu continuous tuning to this reader. Alternative model will be an uh, optimal linear estimator. The optimal linear estimator is, is far superior to the uh, population vector in terms of, of its diminished uh, bias. It's much more robust in the, the noise quality, specifically the, the global uh, uh, the collective uh, mode of fluctuation. <laughs> it will require a, a, a much heavier supervised learning because it requires a, a much, much higher degree of fine tuning. It is extremely sensitive to fine tuning. I you know, used to think uh, otherwise, but it's, it's extremely sensitive, and, um, and and even small fluctuation are going to be very, very uh, um, small deviation will be very, very detrimental to the optimal estimate. Okay, so we had uh, bad news, but uh, we had we have worse news uh, in the optimal near estimate. Fortunately, I know people like to hear that the brain is, is optimal. We have the, the, the most naive readout. <coughs> if you just sum the activities of all the new ones, then just because the distribution is not uniform, okay, we have information about the phase. Okay. In terms of the information, it's inferior to both of them. Okay? But it's absolutely new. You don't need to sum them uniformly, even if you just sum them uh, randomly, it will be the, the trick. Um, 
we haven't quantified how accurate this unit is yet, but, but, but I don't know a lot of the uh, correlation structure, but I think, um, so I don't have a conclusive answer, but, but these are the options I can think of. Each has its own advantages and disadvantages. I think in terms of robustness, the uniform pooling is, um, is absolutely robust. Thank you very much. Thank you. 